If you look in your bulletin, you'll notice the reading is a very long one today, 32 verses long, and uh, just know that our attention span in this uh, very distractible age is limited, so I'm only going to read the section in the bolder print starting at verse 14, uh, just to give you some context. This is the Apostle Paul giving uh, his second defense in front of governors now, and uh, I'll explain it a little bit more. Uh, he tells the story of his conversion on the Damascus Road, and that's where we pick up in the reading uh, at that part of his own testimony at verse 14. Listen now, this is God's word. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, are you out of your mind? Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth, for the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time will you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. The king stood up, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. The word of the Lord. Uh, we've been looking this summer at the writer who gave us the gospel according to Luke, and we've been focused on his second volume, uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And by the way, I've mentioned this before, if uh, you take the Gospel of Luke, and add it to the Acts of the Apostles, it means that Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. So that's something important to consider. And in this uh, second volume, Luke the historian is trying to show us how the resurrected Jesus Christ continues to do things and how he has qualified to be the one to pour out on the church, the spirit of God. So as my body is animated by the spirit within me, uh, so the church as a body would be animated and moved by the spirit of God dwelling in the church. And the church is ignited. The church is, as I've called this whole series, the incendiary fellowship. The church is on fire and gone into the Roman Empire. Everywhere it goes, the message of the gospel spreads. And in just a few generations... 
the message of the gospel will so permeate the Roman Empire that when the Roman Empire falls, some 60% of the Roman Empire will be Christian. The Roman Empire will collapse, but Christianity will remain standing in its ashes. And that's the story of the Acts of the Apostles. Today, I want to try to show by the Apostle Paul's defense before Festus and Agrippa, I want to try to show the dramatic flexibility of the gospel and simultaneously the durability and permanence and unchangeable character of the gospel, the basic message of Christianity. It speaks flexibly into any and every situation and yet it is also immutable, unchangeable and unbending, uncompromising in what it says. If you get the gospel you begin to recognize all the similarities that you have with people in the world. And if you begin to see the similarities between yourself and other people, it assists you in communicating grace and truth to other people. Even people who apparently are very different from you, people from other cultures, people with other political persuasions, people from other backgrounds, people from other classes, people at different educational levels. The gospel enables you to see past those surface differences down to the true and deeper things that all people share in common, that we all share a common human nature. And the gospel helps you see that. Paul is able to point to this at the very end of his speech when he answers the king. The king says, do you want me to become like you? And Paul answers as if to say, truth is you're already like me, except for the jewelry, except for the handcuffs, and uh, except for the fact that I believe and you don't believe. Uh, I've received the grace of God and you have not yet received. Other than that, we're basically exactly the same. The gospel enables you to find common ground with any other person and Therefore, it is extremely flexible and adaptable and applicable to whomever you meet. And the gospel is also absolute. It's not as if you find another person and you can so tailor the gospel so that you can take out everything that's offensive to that person. The gospel speaks on its own terms. It's one of a kind, absolute. The gospel says something that our culture hates to hear, that there is a way of salvation, there is a way of salvation, and the gospel will not bend on that. The gospel will not waver or compromise on that. It's rigid, it's uncompromising, and yet it is crazy flexible and adaptable to every person in every situation. So how can that be? That's the topic today. The gospel of Jesus Christ totally immovable and uncompromising, and yet completely flexible. How can those two seemingly contradictory ideas both be true? That's what we want to show today. Number one, an odd occasion. Number two, a specialized speech. And number three, an insane intrusion of grace and truth. An odd occasion, a specialized speech, and an insane intrusion of grace and truth. That's our topic today. Uh, We're coming into the fourth quarter of this book, and uh, this could be thought of as the captivity section of the book, where Paul is in police custody from here on out. Uh, He has returned to the city where he spent so much of his life, Jerusalem. Christians warned him not to go back to Jerusalem, that he would be arrested, but he recognized that even that could be part of God's plan for his life. And so he did return because he loved the people. And he desperately wanted the people of Jerusalem, his fellow Israelites, to see, look, Jesus Christ is not anti-Jewish. Jesus Christ was Jewish. In fact, Jesus Christ was, from this perspective, the most Jewish person that ever lived on planet Earth. Jesus Christ was not opposed to the law of Moses. In fact, Jesus Christ was the number one proponent of the law of Moses who ever lived. Why? Because he's the only one who obeyed the law of Moses. So you could say you're in favor of the law of Moses. If you don't obey it, you're not really in favor of it. 
And Jesus Christ, we could say, was the number one lover of the law because he actually did what no other human being has ever done. He lived completely by the law of Moses. And he obeyed it, not the way we obey sometimes, holding on for dear life, white-knuckled, forcing ourselves to obey. We find obedience depleting. It sort of takes the energy out of us when we have to do what we don't want to do. But it was the opposite for Jesus. It wasn't depleting for him, it was nourishing for him. In fact, he said to his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. For him to obey was a joy. It was nourishing. It was like a dance. And Paul wants Jerusalem to see. Look, we all try to convince each other that we're keeping the law of Moses. But we don't. Why can't we be honest about it? And why can't we see that finally, the obedient man has appeared on the scene? The man who upholds all the law of Moses. He came to obey for us. He came to take the blame for our disobedience. And his resurrection shows that what he claimed about himself is actually true. And his resurrection shows that God received his sacrifice on behalf of everyone that he represents. And now... Paul is in jail. You remember the scene, if you were with us, he stood up on the stairs in the temple and he spoke to the Jews. He mentioned that he'd been consorting with the Gentiles and the Jew Jewish people freaked out. They tried to pull him down and literally rip him limb from limb. The police came in, broke up the angry mob. They arrested Paul just to get him out of there. And they had to take him away to a, a different prison because the Jewish people wouldn't have him there. They were still wanting to execute him, so they took him 75 miles away to the Mediterranean coast and the city of Caesarea, and they put him in the prison jail at Caesarea. And now these same fanatics who comprise that mob have appealed to the Roman government. We'd like you to extradite Paul from Caesarea and bring him back to where he committed the crimes. We want you to bring him back to Jerusalem where we would like to try him and we would like to execute him. And the Roman governor Festus says, Paul, would this be okay with you if I took you from Caesarea and extradite you back to Jerusalem where you supposedly committed this crime? Don't you want to stand in front of your accusers? And Paul says, I do not want to stand in front of my accusers. They still want to rip me limb from limb. And Paul, as it were, raises his hand and says, I am a Roman citizen. And on that basis, I appeal to Caesar. And when Paul does that, it's like um, pulling a ripcord on a parachute. Once you pull it, you can't gather it back up again. It's like, it's like tapping out in wrestling. Once, once you tap out, it's over. It's like breaking an egg. You can't, you can't put the white and the yolk back in the shell after it's done. And once Paul said, I appeal to Caesar, it's over. In fact, Festus puts it this way. You said, I appeal to Caesar, and to Caesar you shall go. And now Festus, and, and I know... Uh, the congregation will have a hard time with all these names that are thrown out, so I'll keep trying to remind you of who these characters are. Festus has replaced Felix. Remember Felix the cat from last week. Felix was the Roman governor. Felix left Paul to languish in prison for two years, and then he's replaced by Festus. Festus uh, has heard Paul's appeal. Festus is a Roman governor. He's a Gentile. And therefore, he doesn't quite understand the charges that are made against Paul. To Festus, they look kind of like an intramural squabble about Jewish theology. And he doesn't know why this is coming before the Roman tribunal to begin with. And now Paul has said, I appeal to Caesar. So Festus is required to honor that appeal and to send Paul to meet with the high court of Rome, Caesar, but he also has to write down the charges made against 
Paul, and he knows that Caesar won't understand these charges, and Caesar will get mad at Festus for honoring this silly appeal. So he has a dilemma on his hand, and that's when a king arrives at the palace in Caesarea. He is the last in the long line of Herod's. His name is Herod Agrippa. His sister is with him named Bernice. Herod Agrippa is Jewish. He is the counterpart to Festus, Festus being the secular authority over Jerusalem and Agrippa being the Jewish religious authority over Jerusalem. They both have approximately equal powers and they both belong squarely to Rome. Agrippa shows up. Festus is happy because he figures, I really need some good Jewish advice. And he tells Agrippa about this prisoner who's been languishing in jail for two years. We just don't know what to do with him. And so Agrippa says, sure, I'll give him an audience. Why don't we bring him out and I'll try to give you my Jewish perspective on all that's going on here. So they set up a big meeting. It says everybody put on their fancy purple clothing and all the royals tried to outdo one another in what they were wearing. And they bring together all this big convocation of royals, especially the Roman royals, Festus and his company, and the Jewish royals, Agrippa and Bernice and their company, and then they parade out, not in purple garments, probably in an orange jumpsuit with jewelry, chains. They bring out the Apostle Paul, and Festus looks at Agrippa and says, take it away, Agrippa. And Agrippa looks at Paul and says, Paul, what do you have to say for yourself? And Paul is enabled to give his longest presentation, his longest defense in front of the royals. There's Festus, the secular Roman authority, and there's Agrippa and Bernice, the Jewish authority. It's an odd occasion because you can see the juxtaposition, all this royal clothing, and then this poor prisoner who's been sitting in a jail cell for two years, and Paul is given the floor, and he makes his longest defense. He tells his whole story, no interruptions. And one of the oddest things that takes place in this story is the appeal. Paul did a dumb thing, apparently. He appealed to Caesar, and that means that the royals can't just let him go, because he made the appeal. He tapped out. He pulled the chute. He cracked the egg. It can't be taken back. He's appealed And now they have to send him on to Caesar. Seems like a dumb thing that Paul did. He could have gotten released. But I think we're going to see Paul was dumb like a fox in his strategy. So second, first, there's an odd occasion. Second, there's a specialized speech. And this is where the real flexibility and adaptability of the gospel comes shining through. Paul is playing to his audience. And you see Paul always speaking in the book of Acts to different audiences, and he's very careful in tailor-making his presentation to each particular audience. We've seen it in other speeches, like when he was speaking to the Jewish extremists, and Paul put himself in their place, which of course we can understand because Paul used to be a Jewish extremist, and so he can relate to them. But we sit here wondering, how is a prisoner in handcuffs going to relate to these royal people, and yet it's exactly what Paul does. Later in the New Testament, he'll actually tip his hand and and tell us, this is why I did things this way. This is my methodology. He'll tell the church at Corinth, to the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I became all things to all people. He becomes like a chameleon. He becomes like the people to whom he speaks. He deliberately puts himself on their level. He extracts everything he can from his own life, which is like theirs, and then he sort of trumpets that. To the pagan academics in Athens, which Chris Curtis told us about a couple weeks ago, he becomes a professor. He quotes their poets. He 
uh, is conversant in their philosophies. He could relate to all people because he didn't see himself as being better than anyone. In fact, he saw himself as a world-class sinner. And he'll actually say the words, I am the worst person that ever lived. I am the chief sinners. In the sin category, I take the gold medal every time. The worst sinner that you'll ever meet. And what I am, he'll say, what I am, I am because of the grace of God. And that enables Paul to speak to people as a fellow. Here, he uses both his Romanness to talk to Festus, and he uses his Jewishness to talk to Agrippa. He uses Roman adages, like to kick against the goads. That was a Roman adage or, or phrase that everyone would have known. He uses uh, another Roman adage where he says, these things didn't happen in a corner. Again, that's not churchy talk that Paul is using there. That's the slang of the day. That's street talk that Paul is using. The very form of of the speech that Paul gives. It adheres to the ancient rhetorical form called the apologia. It was a Roman form of speech. It begins with the defendant waving his arm. And that's what it says. Paul waved his arm because he knew that's how Roman speeches progress. He's totally flexible. All things to all people. Wherever you put Paul, because he sees himself as a man bought by grace, he's able to totally relate to his audience. He addresses the king with a particular form of speech called an exordium. And again, that's how ancient rhetoric took place. When an underling addressed his superiors, it was incumbent on him to sort of tout their qualifications. And if you look at the beginning of this speech, you'll see Paul saying, oh, excellent, Agrippa, and he sort of touts Agrippa's qualifications. Totally flexible to the situation. Becoming all things to all people that he might save some. And then he uses ideas that they could sort of attach to. For instance, he focuses on the whole idea of authority. These were governors. They recognized the need for authority in the world. And Paul helps them see, I also recognize the need for authority in the world. I came from a long line of serious Jewish people. I was well known for being a man who adhered to training, to teaching, to tradition, to authority. I know about authority. I'm with you guys in your love for authority. I held to the teachings of the fathers. I stayed in the line of the tradition, of the authority even when I thought to persecute these Christians who I deemed to be members of a pseudo-Jewish cult that had to be stamped out. But I didn't go after them until the chief priest gave me authority. You appreciate authority. So do I, says Paul. I'm like you. But, O oh great kings, on that Damascus road, I met the authority. I met the king of all kings. I met the resurrected man on that Damascus road. And you want to talk about a person with authority. He had so much glory and authority that he shined brighter than the sun. He is the one authority who cannot be resisted. To try to resist him would be like kicking the sharp end of a cattle prod with your foot and thinking you're going to come away okay. It's just going to make things worse. I didn't make this up. What I say to you, I got from the authority of all authorities, the risen man on the Damascus road when heaven came down to me. And then Paul appeals to the Jewish authority, to Agrippa. He can say, Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. He'll appeal to that authority. And then Paul will emphasize in this specialized speech, not only things that he knows his audience will agree with, but he will also say things with which they'll have great difficulty. He will speak of the resurrection. And you know, if you're familiar with the New Testament, that both the Romans and the Jews 
found the idea of a resurrected man to be repugnant. But Paul can't change the facts. Why is it considered incredible, says Paul in verse 8, that God should raise the dead? He wants the people to doubt their doubts. He says, do you really believe in an almighty God who made all things by the words of his mouth? Well, if there is a God like that, couldn't he take a dead man and raise him from the dead? Do you really want to dismiss that? And then Paul speaks of the gospel facts. In verse 23, according to the scriptures, Moses and the prophets, that the Christ was to suffer and by his resurrection proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And again in verse 18, Jesus Christ sent me to Jewish people and to Gentiles to open their eyes that they might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God and to receive forgiveness and an inheritance among those who are set apart by faith in me, says Jesus Christ. And that people everywhere, at the highest echelons of society, like you royals, and at the lowest levels of society, that people everywhere should repent and turn to God and live new lives corresponding to this new way. See, the point is, and I hope I'm not losing you here, but the point is, Paul can be so Roman to the Romans, and he can be so Jewish to Agrippa and Bernice. He's in their house, and if he has to play by their rules... He's happy to do that. He's happy to use their language. He's happy to be totally relatable. It's like the meatloaf song. You know that song? I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. It's like Paul saying, look, I'll do anything for the gospel. I'll do anything, but I won't lie to you about the good news. I won't do that. I'll wear your clothes. I'll wear your orange jumpsuit, I'll wear your jewelry, I'll wear your chains, I'll use your slang, I'll endorse your authority, but I won't lie about this. God has made a promise to Abraham, and now in the fullness of time, the seed of Abraham has appeared on the stage of human history in the person of Jesus Christ, and he lived up to the law like no person ever did. And he suffered and died for my sins and has risen from the dead so that everyone who is represented by him can be forgiven and renovated and made new. And then Paul does something surprising. You'd think that after languishing in a jail cell for two years, when Paul finally gets his day in court, you'd think that he'd be fighting for his life you think that he'd be saying things that would lead to his exoneration and being liberated from the jail cell. You'd think that if he was finally given an opportunity to make a plea deal, that he would really put his ducks in a row and say things that would lead to his release from prison. But instead, it turns out he's not fighting for his life. He's fighting for their lives. And he ends his speech by appealing directly to the Roman authority and to the Jewish authority. He says, Jesus Christ is presenting light to both Jewish people and to Gentile people. Did he point at them when he was saying that? The Bible doesn't say. But the way they both respond makes it clear. He is definitely having them in mind where he says, God is giving light to Jewish people and to Roman people. Festus responds, Paul, are you out of your mind? Have you been reading too much in that jail cell? Has all your your learning driven you mad? You have one shot to get out of jail. And are you going to turn this into some sort of evangelistic opportunity? Are you crazy? And that's why I called the last point an insane intrusion of grace and truth. Because Paul is literally wasting his opportunity to get out of jail in order to appeal directly to these high-powered people and tell them what he calls the sober truth. Then he does the same thing with the Jewish authority, the Jewish King Agrippa. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. 
And the king responds, basically, are you crazy? In such a short time, do you think you're going to convert me? I'm your judge, son. I'm the only one who could let you out of jail. And you're going to try to convert me right in my own courtroom? Are you trying to persuade me to become like you? Are you trying to persuade me to become a Christian? And it's as if Paul is responding, look, you royal people. Don't you see what's going to happen soon and very soon? I'm talking to you, Agrippa. And I'm talking to you, Festus. I know what's going to happen to you. Soon and very soon, you're going to find yourself in a bed, unable to get out of that bed. And you're going to hear someone who's attending you refer to that bed as a deathbed. And as you lay in your deathbed, looking around at all the people around you, soon you'll find yourself floating up and looking down on your own body. And then you'll find yourself having to give an answer for your life as you stand before the holy, holy, holy God. And all the excuses that you've always been using all your life will look so silly and absurd that you won't even have the courage to mouth those excuses before the majesty on high. And you'll feel in that moment just like Adam and Eve, naked and ashamed. And all of your fig leaf excuses will have dropped to the ground and you'll be trying to cover yourself in the presence of God. You'll feel like Adam and Eve. You'll feel like Isaiah, who when he saw God, saw the holiness of God and saw his own moral corruption, and Isaiah said in that moment, woe is me, I am ruined, I'm doomed. I'm a sinful man. I have a filthy mouth and I live among people with filthy mouths. And when we stand in that moment, Agrippa and Festus and Bernice, when we stand in that moment having floated off of our deathbed and standing in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God, and we have to give an answer for our lives, for our apathy, for our gossip, for our prayerlessness, for our greed, for, as Jesus Christ said, every careless word that you have ever spoken, you'll have to give an answer for that before God. And when that comes, Agrippa and Festus, then it won't matter that I was in jail for a little bit longer. It won't even matter if I lost my head in jail. In that moment, as you stand before God, you will wish that you had someone to speak for you. You wish you had an attorney when you get your day in court. You'll wish you had an advocate. And I'm here trying to tell you, purple-robed, fine people, there is such an advocate. It is the man who obeyed on my behalf and who suffered for me and who rose from the dead to show that I am accepted by God on behalf of him my advocate. Oh, kings, am I crazy? I'm not crazy, but I am covered. And I wish you could be covered. I wish you could be just like me, except for the jewelry, except for the chains. I wish you could be just like me, a big sinner who has a big savior. He could be your advocate if you will only believe that's why Paul wanted to get to Nero. He wanted to tell the low people and the high people about this one advocate, this one way of salvation. Now let me come back home here for a second and talk to you. You may think the same thing, in a sense. I don't know why you're here today. A friend might have invited you here today. Maybe you just come every week because it's the thing that you do on Sundays. Maybe someone invited you to church. Maybe when you thought about coming to church today, you expected that it would be just a normal day. There'd be people in nice clothes. Maybe you'd see a couple women wearing hats. Or not. Maybe you thought that, you know, it'd be a safe and secure place. Maybe you hoped for a little inspiration, 
some nice music. Maybe you thought the preacher would give you some news you could use, some inspirational ideas for this coming week, some life-affirming ideas. And look, I truly hope it has been a life-affirming moment for you, but, but what? Did you expect in coming to church today that someone was going to try to convert you? How confrontational is that? How countercultural is that? Are you trying to convert me, preacher? Yeah. I'm trying to convert you. I'm trying to persuade you. This is a matter of life and death. I will say with Paul, yeah, I wish you could be just like me, but without the chains. And the question I have for you is, how about it? What are you going to do with what you heard today? Wouldn't it be great if you could walk out of here with an advocate who will speak for you after you leave your deathbed and stand before the holy, holy, holy God? Wouldn't it be great if there was someone who could take care of your past, things about which you are deeply ashamed, your present things about which you are completely concerned, and your future? Wouldn't it be great if the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ, the perfect advocate, would embrace you so that you didn't really matter whether you stayed in jail or not? Wouldn't it be great to be persuaded? I want to urge you to be persuaded. It might take a little time, or it might take a long time. But please, don't leave here today without looking into this person. Because I think if you do, you will be persuaded. This advocate, you can receive him today as your advocate and your Lord. Let's pray together.